First of all, I uh, wanted to thank you all for uh, coming here today and participating in this uh, celebration of the World Water Day. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, the Oklahoma uh, Cooperative Extension uh, Service, the Department of Biosystems and Ag Engineering, and the BAE Graduate Student Association for supporting and sponsoring this seminar today in celebration of the World Water Day. As you know, we have uh, several speakers today uh, who will talk about different aspects of water and energy. Uh, and we really want this to be a very interactive uh, experience for everybody. We really love to hear from you, from your experiences. So please feel free to um, raise hand and ask questions during presentations or after presentations or make any comments or share your experience and, and perspective with us. Um, I'm going to go, go first and talk a little bit about the World Water Day and their theme for 2014. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, water requirement for agricultural production. Uh, and then we'll have uh, other speakers talking to us about other topics. Now, World Water Day started about 10, 10 11 years ago uh, on March 22nd every year. Lots of organizations and uh, educational institutions from everywhere around the world uh, celebrate this day. And the, the goal for this celebration is to improve the sustainable management of uh, freshwater resources and to bring all the stakeholders to the table and, and encourage collaboration and cooperation. Every year they focus on a specific topic related to water. And this topic for 2014 is water and energy and how these two resources are interconnected. Uh, for this year, they, they have five key messages. Uh, first one is water requires energy and energy requires water. Second message is that supplies are limited and demand is increasing. Third is saving energy is saving water and vice versa. Fourth message is that the bottom billion of the world population needs access to both water and sanitation as well as energy. And finally, the last but not the least is that improving water and energy efficiency is imperative as are coordinated, coherent, and concerted policies. Now, um, I have a few slides just to look at this interconnection between water and energy. And I got these slides from different sources. They're wonderful information on the web, different infographics from different institutions. This is the, the world energy supply uh, from 1971 to 2030 that shows how our demand for energy is increasing. And if you look at these different types, different sources of energies, um, you notice that almost all of them, probably except uh, solar and wind, they require water uh, in, in one or another way. An example is the um, coal power plants. Um, this is a wonderful infographics. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it gives an idea of how much water is required to extract, transport, store, process, and dispose coal. Also, some very useful and interesting information about the coal production and use in the United States and the amount of water that it requires and how much that water uh, really is. I'll let you uh, look at those numbers and figures. One thing that, that I want to emphasize is um, the information down here at the bottom. Uh, generating energy requires a lot of water. But then an important point is that this water is used but not used up. So a lot of it goes back to streams and rivers and, and ponds. So in, in dry years, when we don't have enough water, there are some significant challenges for energy generation. First of all, if there's not enough water, there's not enough water in the ponds or in the streams, it's going to be very difficult for, for power plants to use that to, to have any water for cooling. Uh, for hydroelectric, of course, that's obvious. Without any water, there's no, no energy uh, being uh, generated. Another issue is the temperature of the water is higher 
in, in dry in dry and um, um, dry summers and, and dr under drought conditions. So the water going into these power plants is at a higher temperature. The water coming out of them is at a higher temperature too, and that could cause uh, lots of uh, issues. Um, another thing that I should have mentioned in previous slide is that it's it's during droughts and dry summers that farmers also need more water and probably from a little bit deeper aquifer and they need more energy as well so these things go real hand in hand this is an example from China all the black dots are proposed power plants and the underlying map the red tones and orange tones and yellow tones are the water scarcity and how severe it is in different parts of China and if you look at this a large number of these points of these proposed power plants, over 50% of it, as this slide shows, are exactly in, in water short areas. And they're going to need water. So that's, that's another challenge. For producing biofuel, we need water. And we have a, a, a very interesting talk today about water requirement and biofuel production. Uh, this is another very interesting infographic by the circle of blue that, that shows some of the water requirements for, for producing um, biofuel. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time going into details. I, I really like us to, to uh, talk about different experiences, different perspective, and what, what we can really do to be more efficient with use, use of energy and water. But we also, not only we need water for energy generation, we need energy for water as well. One of the main important, uh, the important uses for energy is to treat water. In developing countries, as this slide suggests, about 80% of municipal sewage is discharged into water bodies untreated. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to treat that water. Uh, if it's a drinking water, or if it's uh, wastewater produced in the cities. And we have another uh, talk today about uh, water and energy resources in cities today. We also need energy to be able to produce agricultural crops and feed the growing population. This is another interesting infographic. Uh, again, lots of interesting information. One piece of it that I would like to uh, focus on is the amount of water, amount of fresh water available. Now, this is a very small font, so it's hard to read, but these drops are the total amount of water that we have available. The um, brighter shades are the amount of salt water. As you can see, a large portion of it is just salt water in seas and oceans. And then we have the fresh water that part of it is, is in the ice caps, and part of it is only a small part of it is accessible to us. Another interesting uh, statistics in this is that 70% of total water withdrawals is for agricultural production, for irrigation uses, and that's a large portion of water with withdrawals, 70%. So without energy, uh, we really cannot produce much. Uh, if you look at China, they use 62% uh, of the water for agricultural uh, purposes, for irrigating crops. That's, that's a large portion of their water use. Here's the situation by 2030. 2009, this is where they were. This is the water demand. 2030, this is the amount of water that they're going to need. But this, their supplies is much less than, than the amount of water that they're going to need in, in 2030. So it's an issue everywhere, almost everywhere in the world. And again, um, we, it's, it's really important to not only have the water resources, but to have energy resources to be able to use that water. If you go back not, not very long ago, maybe 150, 200 years ago, this is the situation. We didn't have the energy to be able to extract water and use it for irrigation. This is a well, and that kid is standing right there is actually the workforce because this well and the um, network of other wells down, down below the ground, they were too small for an adult person to go down there and dig the dirt, so they would use kids to go down there. Now, if you are relying on, on manpower to extract water and use it for irrigation, you're not going to be able to irrigate a, a significant amount of land. 
And this situation uh, has been the case for many, many years, for thousands of years, and it's still the case in, in many parts of the world. Uh, this is another example of using manpower for extracting water for irrigation. This is India in 1979. The two gentlemen in, the, in this photo are from a team of, uh, of U.S. Uh, uh, university professors from U.S. visiting India back then and trying to see if they can really crank that, that device by the two of them. This is Vietnam, again using manpower, muscle power, to divert water for irrigating uh, uh, probably rice paddies. So uh, not, not very efficient. Again, we could not uh, do a lot. And then we had uh, diesel pumps. With the help of energy and uh, a little bit of the traditional uh, uh, conveyance methods, we could take these pumps from one place to another place, uh, pump water, and be able to have that nice, beautiful-looking uh, corn in the background. It really helped us to increase agricultural production. And then this is where we stand today. Um, you've all seen uh, these circular features when you're, uh, when you're in the airplane. They're all over the place. Uh, so, uh, one center pivot uh, with a uh, single turn can irrigate uh, 130, 136 uh, acres of land. This is a satellite scene uh, from, uh, from close to Garden City in Kansas. All the circular features are uh, center pivots, irrigated fields. And this is not only happening in the United States. This is Mexico. Um, this Landsat uh, satellite image was taken in 1992. This is 2010, about 18 years difference. And look at the area right here. No irrigation back then, lots of irrigation in uh, 2010. And this is what we call a false color satellite image. Um, uh, everything that shows up in red is vegetation, is healthy, actively growing vegetation because it's captured in near infrared wave band. Um, look at the scale. This is um, 20 miles, so we're talking like 20, 30 miles uh, by 10, 10, 15 miles. A huge area in Mexico. Again, another example, this is again false color, so everything that, that's red is center pivots. Back then, and I don't have the exact years for this one, but it's about the same time span, about 20 years. Uh, no center pivots. This year, you see lots of lots of different center pivots, and then even more, especially in this area and some other parts. Now, where do you think this satellite image is taken? Which part of the world? Any guesses? North China. China? Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> now, this is, this is one of the things that, that I, I'd like all of us to be thinking about and, and talking about and keeping the key five messages in mind. This is happening in Saudi Arabia now. Of course, energy is available there, but I'm not sure about water. It's definitely coming from somewhere to see all those uh, uh, bright green circles. So there is water somewhere in the aquifer, but how much water and how sustainable it is to pump that water out to produce the crops that I'm sure people uh, are heavily relying on. Another example from Egypt, uh, this is in visible colors, and you can see this one is, uh, the, the first image is taken in 1984, the other one is 2012. Uh, no agricultural activity here, huge expansion in 2012. And again, we know Egypt is, or has been for many decades, involved in the Nile, Nile River, River conflict, and there are several other countries and there's disputes going on, lawsuits, and uh, any time all these conflicts could really uh, escalate into something more serious among these countries. Um, all these water extractions and conversions for agricultural use have had um, impacts on other parts of the environment as well. Uh, this is uh, 
Aral Sea in, uh, in Central Asia. And you can see again from satellite imagery the shrinkage in the lake size from 1977 all the way to 2009. And I think if we had a more recent uh, Landsat image, uh, we wouldn't be able to see any water in, in the Aral Sea. So this clearly shows us that the, the water that we're diverting for uh, irrigation um, is having some impacts on, on other ecosystems. Now again, to, to summarize, uh, this is the current situation. On a worldwide basis, about 70% of, of water use is for agricultural purposes. Now where we, where we uh, will go in the future and what are some projections? By 2050, estimates show that we will have 9 billion population that we need to feed. And that's, I think, kind of on the lower uh, range of, of projections. I've seen numbers as large as 10 billion. So this was one of the smallest uh, estimates that I saw. To feed 9 billion people it means that we need a 60% increase in food production. And that requires 20% more water consumption by agricultural crops. Our supplies of water are not going to be increasing, or the amount of water that we have available, but our demands are clear, clearly going to increase. And the other thing that, that was really interesting to me is that we're not only dealing with the increase in population, we're dealing with the change in diets. Now, if you look at how much water it takes to produce one slice of bread and compare it to how much water it takes to produce 150 grams of, of steak, there's a huge difference there. And when you have a country uh, of 1 billion population that's changing diet from rice or bread to beef, it's, it's a big pressure on water. So it's not only the increase in population, it's the change in diet. And 150 gram, I, th I think 150 gram is about five ounces of steak. So I'm, I'm not sure about you, but when I order a steak, I really like it to be more than eight ounces, or at least eight ounces. And that, I think, needs about 3,000 liters of water. So um, some of the solutions that people have been thinking about, and again, I'm not going to read all of these information here. Uh, but there's, there, people have been thinking about some solutions, and I think uh, we also need to look into these solutions as we have been looking into some of these solutions, and we need to bring people from different uh, disciplines together and talk about all these solutions and which one applies to, to the condition in Oklahoma and in the United States and then uh, finally in the world and be able to add to the number of solutions that we have and to see which one is more feasible. That's all I have. Um, if um, anybody has any questions or comments or any experience, I. I have a question. Uh, let me. Uh, I apologize if it's a silly question. Let me, let me get the mic to you. So. that 70 percent of water is for agriculture do you have any figures about how much of that is lost permanently or how much of it can be reused and is somehow remains in the system it's um, it really depends on on the location and on the irrigation system and I'm really not the best person to talk about this or uh, expert in this room. Um, but um, it really depends on the type of irrigation system. If it's a surface gravity fed irrigation system, uh, there are going to be more water um, leaving the field in forms of surface runoff or, or deep percolation. Now, that doesn't mean that that water is necessarily lost, but it might be a lower in quality after going through layers of soil. Um, if, if there are subsurface drip irrigation systems, that evaporation from the soil part of it is, is less, it's minimized, so less water is uh, lost due to evaporation. If there's a sprinkler system and it's a windy day, very hot,
probably a larger portion of it is, is going to be lost due to the, uh, due to the evaporation uh, before it reaches the, the crops and the root zone. I don't know if, if anybody has some numbers for the United States or Elliot, do you have some numbers? Well, the efficiency of the system would vary with, with the type, like you said, hit versus sprinkler versus. The efficiency of the system would vary with the type, uh, whether it's drip, sprinkler, or surface, and you, you stated that. And, um, and that definition of lost, it does depend. You know, some would say, well, the water. Uh, that transpires through the plants is lost, but obviously that's that's just converted to water vapor, and it's used uh, it's used by the plant in its production. So um, a, a w the water budget is not as simple as it first appears when you're looking at irrigation systems. And and as she said in her question, some of it may be used downstream uh, on another field. Do you have? What really changes is is where the source is. So you've moved it from a primary source to another location. And if you don't have the same recharge capability, so if you're pulling groundwater and you don't have the same recharge, if you're mining some of that groundwater, then obviously you're taking more out than it's going back in. So you're changing the location. And if it's not raining as much as it may have rained in the past, then the surface water is not being put back in the same place. So you don't really lose water, you just lose it in the location that you started with. And that's where the, the problems occur, because as you know, we have a lot of water, it's just not necessarily in the right place at the right time when we actually need it. 